Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News or our monthly housing and uh, economic update with our friend Martin North. How are you, Martin? Uh, good. Running around like uh, you wouldn't believe at the moment. There's so much going on, isn't there? I have seen you upload a few of your uh, radio appearances and that. So uh, what, what's been the, I guess, uh, point of interest for people in general? What's Why have you been getting these call-ups? Well, I've had a lot of that interest in what's called the bank of mum and dad. So this is where older households are passing money off to kids to buy property for the first time, right? It's been a big trend that's happened recently. And um, I issued a report, I don't know, about six weeks ago, and pretty much every media outlet from a to z has sort of wanted to talk about it because they think it's a significant event it probably is actually because it's a very significant distortion of the market but that's keeping me very busy at the moment yeah i'm looking forward to diving into that because some of those stats um yeah i saw those and they are big compared to every country in the world i believe Correct. just about absolutely yeah yeah this is madness so uh, you know madness squared in, in some ways right it's just another distortion that we've got in, in the housing sector at the moment. And we'll get into some of that because, you know, there's some big, big questions we've got to ask below the surface, I think. Yeah, I mean, I might just give like my broad overview. One of the arguments that I often um, like put forward to the, the housing bulls is we've had this fantastic period of lowering interest rates, prosperity. Australia was the lucky country. We had that boom. You've gone from, uh, you know, dad in the 70s, 60s, being able to pay for a mortgage himself on a sole wage. Now you've got mum and dad, or two people, I should say, you know, on full-time jobs. These mortgages have gotten longer, and we've just stretched all these limits. So my argument is, if you tell me that property is going to grow at the same rate or going to double every seven or ten years, whatever, you know, are you saying that there's going to be four people working these full-time, longer-hour, higher-paying jobs to even get on the property ladder, and interest rates are going to keep going from 17% to, to zero, so they're going to be negative 17 you know, It just can't happen. It's just impossible. Well, there is, a, there is a point of limitation, right? And we've got to rock bottom interest rates. We've got to lending multiples where, you know, it's six, seven, eight times on two incomes. That's pretty high. And as you say, unless you actually bring more people into the fold, so it's four times income, right? That's one way of doing it. Extending the duration is the other one, and that's very significant. In Japan, you get 100-year mortgages. And what that basically means is that you've converted your mortgage effectively into rent. You actually are now continuing to pay for the whole of your life, right? And you never expect to pay it off. That's the end game, right? But once you've gone there, well, can prices go even higher? Well, it's difficult to see. So there is going to be some bounds i think but of course in the short term expect more momentum i think yeah and, and the other thing you say is well what else can you do and that's where you see government say well five percent down bigger first time uh, owner grants bigger builder grants mm. um, negative gearing you've got to try and go sideways if you can't go you know vertical but um <laughs> let's dive into these slides martin so okay the dow's hit another all-time high um How's using the, the F word? I'll let you explain that. But it's the same situation in Australia here. It's just this, this jawboning from central bankers about it's going to be lower for longer, no matter what data we get. It's We're still going to keep rates low, even if everything gets better. Um, it, it, nothing matters anymore. It's literally just bots and algos hanging on every word the central bank is saying these speeches. Well, essentially, uh, fundamental value is disappearing, right, as, as, as a fundamental driver to value in the, in the stock markets, right? It's momentum trading. And as you say, a lot of it is actually automatic trading. Um, and of course, around the world, everybody's now saying, well, you know, is it, are we really at the, at the top? You know, as the old adage, selling man go away, well, it looks as though you should have hang on, and not sold because prices have gone even higher. But it's interesting because Powell actually came out at the end of last month and said, look, the markets are eventually a bit frothy, right? That's the F word I'm talking about. Um, for, you know, when, when a central banker says, yeah, the markets are a bit frothy, then anyone will say, well, you know, there's nothing too much to worry about, but we should just be a little cautious. But some of the other um, Federal Reserve um, senior people in sort of across the states in the US are much more worried about what's going on here with the massive inflation in markets and whether you look at house prices, whether you look at other asset prices. So we've got this massive machine where effectively it's being driven by all this quantitative easing and money printing and all of that sort of stuff. But the question is, you know, where's reality in all of this and, and what could uh, knock it off its perch? And that's really the big question now. Uh, I didn't see that, Martin. What Do you know roughly what day it was when he said markets are frothy? I think it was about the 28th of uh, last month. 
and the markets fall that day. I might bring up the chart and have a quick look. But it, it, I thought that would have made bigger headlines because of what happened, you know, recently with Janet Yellen. And I know there's yep. another governor that came out and said oh, something about, you know, stretched valuation. Correct. Or yeah. So a couple of them have actually. Some of the sort of the other, the other, you know, because the Federal Reserve system is multiple Federal Reserves, right? And they've each got a head, right? Yeah. So so Powell is looking at sort of one one angle, but. There are others, and they've actually been more um, negative with regard to what's going on, and more, expressing more concerns about the risks and uh, the the frothiness of the of, of the market. So there there is definitely some concerns from some areas, but of course most of the conversation in the U.S. is inflation led rather than actually market price led. Interestingly, okay. Uh, I can't see anything. Anyway, I might look that up later. But um, no, that's that's really interesting because it, the words that they're saying are moving markets more than ever. That shows you how, I guess, sensitive they are and fragile. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think you've got the next point I want to make. Yeah, you've got the Janet Yellen stuff here as well. So <laughs> what, to, what to me is so interesting about this is that they are starting to, I think they try and control the market. So they try and use that word that'll just bring the market down a little bit and they try and almost have a red day or two and control things. Whereas in Australia, it's quite different. At the moment, we've got, in terms of the housing market, low and that coming out and, and saying there's no problem. Mm. And so it's quite different, whereas I thought they would start to change their language to almost sort of spook the market or at least make them be cautious. Well, we'll come on to the Reserve Bank because there was a very interesting statement from Guy de Bell out overnight, that's the deputy governor. And basically there he's saying, we're trading off higher home prices against lower um, unemployment. So you kind of have both, which is a really mad way of thinking about it. It is, isn't it? So <laughs> yes. inflation or deflation? We've spoken about this uh, a lot. Um, yeah. The deflationary forces are so powerful that they're fighting, but the problem is where they're directing the inflation hose, as we've spoken about a lot, is inappropriate. Uh, it's I joke about that sausage machine where they keep <laughs> – you're just putting more and more in and they're wondering why it's not resulting in wage growth and prosperity for the people, which is one of the RBA's mandates. Hmm. It's just resulting in higher markets and higher house prices, higher inequality. Hmm. No, that's right. And of course, Yellen came out and said, look, it may well be we'll have to put rates up sooner uh, because of all the stimulus. So, you know, there's massive stimulus in the US and more coming, uh, in huge amounts. And then the question is, well, how much of that stimulus gets into the real economy? And could that actually then drive inflation? And of course, many of the market uh, participants believe that inflation is really already stronger than the official figures, as we've discussed previously. And they're expecting it to be stronger sooner, which means effectively rates will have to go up. And of course, the bond rates earlier on were actually indicating that they, they're still ahead if you look sort of 10 years down the track but they haven't really continued to, to, to rise. So there is this question about inflation, deflation. But then if you come across to Australia, the latest official figures, which I've put up there, which is the um, ones relating to the cost of living indices, it's actually split out there by different types of households in Australia from the ABS. And basically, you know, there's nothing that in those numbers that would suggest that in Australia, in official terms, inflation is anything to worry about at the moment. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the, the Reserve Bank is saying, well, it might be up to sort of 3% temporarily because of the adjustments from last year with childcare and other things. But no, there's no structural issue with regard to inflation. Um, rather, in fact, um, you know, it, it's going to be tough to move it up. And of course, you know, RBA has failed miserably to meet its uh, inflation targets, despite the fact it's now saying it wants to sort of see inflation firmly within the 2 to 3% band before they start lifting rates. So we are in this weird, you know, twilight zone where you've got a bunch of indicators saying yeah inflation is definitely there and in fact if you look at cost of goods if you look at some of them uh, manufacturing sectors there's cost rising and um, that yet the official statistics say no no no, nothing to see here so either the statistics are wrong are we measuring it right or uh, effectively inflation is just uh, in a few areas and overall inflation is still low the lived experience of many australians though in terms of what they're spending week in week out is that prices are still rising and very fast uh, absolutely. I don't think anyone uh, doubts that. You've got those long-term trend interest rates and what people will sort of notice just by eyeballing this is the most recent bounce was probably the smallest one they've had in terms of only getting rates from zero to uh, 2.5 and it was mm. in a hurry. Like They basically knew that they were only putting them up to give them some firepower to put them back down 
and and now we're in this zone where they're kind of kidding themselves to even be talking about raising rates and without being you know uh, sensationless it is kind of coming to an end this this mm. monetary system because it's relied on the growth of debt and we have reached the the physical limitations in a lot of ways it's almost the like the commodities we've seen those huge costs of things like copper and you know lumber and all that it's because we've concentrated so much money and wealth and inequality at this uh, intangible economy that we talk about that the tangible economy has been so unloved you know nobody wants to be a farmer these days or things like that and we've forgotten about the real goods that are actually pretty important and now we've got way too much money and and not enough you know production or it's just become not a priority which is crazy to think about Mm. Well, this you know, this is the eighty-year view, right? And, and you know, I be I believe there is some merit in thinking about these longer-term cycles as well as the short-term cycles, right? And, and if you look at it, that chart is it happens to show the three months Treasury in the U.S., but you can pretty much see that wherever you look around the world, every time there's been a, a recession, they've cut rates and they've tried to put them up, but they haven't got to where they got previously. So, so the eighty-year cycle is rates went up rates are now down and the reason rates are so low is because as you mentioned the debt but that can't go on forever and that's really the the what next question of course is the really critical question so do we effectively see the the collapse of this sort of cyclic, cyclical approach in which case you know is it a crypto future or is it a central bank digital currency future or um you know what is it right i think we're getting close now to that critical inflection point where the next phase of whatever the financial system is is going to be dis disconnected in some way from the last 80 years. Wow, Martin, you're coming round. You're coming round to uh, the, the crypto future. <laughs> it's definitely one of them. You know, it's not the only one, but, but you know, y y the point is you can't take rates much lower from where they are. Okay, you can go negative, right? Yeah, sure, you could. But, but this cyclical approach, and, and overlay that, Inflation, right? Where was inflation? Inflation was at the highest in the 1980s, right? That's when Nixon, of course, came off the gold standard, right? Um, since then, inflation has actually been lower and lower and lower and lower. It's gone up and down a bit, but it's been lower, right? So maybe, maybe we're actually in a deflationary rather than an inflationary phase, which means, of course, that some of the asset um, suggestions and, uh, and ideas that people have may be going in the right direction, right? So, so there are some fundamental questions. And you know, what I want to do over the next um, few months is start exploring some of these alternative futures now because people are talking about great resets. They're talking about you know, the move from the US dollar to something else. They're talking about central bank digital currencies where all the experiments are currently running. All of those things are in play. The question is, are they thinking radical? Should they be thinking radical or are they just thinking, um, you know, incremental change? I wonder whether we aren't, might actually be in for a more radical shakeup than many people think. Yeah, and I think well, you, people say, oh, that radical is uh, impossible. I'd never do that. But a couple of years ago, if you had said that they'd do, you know, these trillions of dollars or they'd be handing out the, these checks of this size, so many things are happening now that you would have said were impossible even five, ten years ago. Um, negative interest rates, oh, I can't remember which European country it was, but now they're being applied to all accounts under um, over $16,000. Mm. And remember when they first had it and it was on accounts with like a million dollars and people said, oh, it's just the rich or even before that it was higher again or you know, just the banks and then just the big businesses and it's working its way down to everyone. And so I think that negative interest rate is just, you know, it's only another 25 basis point cut when they actually do it, but it's a very significant uh, milestone in people's mind when they mm. start getting this, you know, this bill each month or whatever it is. So, so the, the critical point to make is that the debt machine is up to max, right? So we're, we're creating more and more and more and more debt. The, the amount of debt in the system has never been higher. Um, more people are actually therefore, in, if I can put it in commas, enslaved to it because they're servicing their debt and people basically are being measured by their ability to service debt, never mind about repaying debt, you know, that's why the 50-year um, the mortgage and the 100-year mortgage is, is what's going on, you know, and, and companies just roll the bonds over and never have to repay the bonds. Um, we are in this mad world where effectively the, the amount of debt in the system has got, I think, uncontrollably high. And, you know, they can't put rates up because if they do, then basically 
that's going to cost too much. So the only way is to go down or sideways, right, or do something different. Now, if they do something different, that means, well, moving to a different form of currency, a different basis of currency. I mean, how do you do that? You know, do you sort of revalue everything on the next day on the new basis? Or, or do you sort of force people into a digital currency first, take away cash and then control it like that? I mean, those are sorts of some of the big picture questions, which yeah. I think we should be thinking about. And, you know, not, not to be alarmist, but just to try and think through how this plays out, because clearly the current mode of operation is deficient. Yeah, and it's happened in, throughout history, you know, every 40 years, 50 years, whatever it is. And so we're almost due for a currency reset of some type. China and Russia have been hoarding a lot of gold. Um, do you do some sort of commodity-based system? Or, yeah, it's what do you pin it to now yep. that everything is just, you know, airy-fairy and digital? That's hmm. the big question. Um, yeah, or, or, or is, is the crypto future, you know, where effectively it's just market demand supply that fundamentally drives the price and there's nothing underpinning it directly right or do you try and pin it to gold or you know a basket of currency i mean those are sorts of some of the the questions that people of course are scratching their heads about and you know this is this is going to play out i think it's going to play out more quickly perhaps than frankly i thought two or three years ago i thought that central banks were going to be more sensible than they have been right um, but they're out of ammo pretty much I think they're out of policy, and I think there's, they're fundamentally not able to really switch to the next mode of thinking that they need to be able to actually you know, take us to a better place. So that's, that, that's how I see it at the moment. Yeah, I think there's a lack of understanding of, even, of economics, which Steve Keen talks about and people like that. <laughs> it's crazy to think that their models don't account for things like banks' debt and money. Yep. Um, they don't understand the system, and so they're not going to change appropriately. But... Um, Look, they even are ignoring or um, denying the fact that their policies cause inequality mm. and they're causing asset prices to rise. Yep. Like, it's just lying through their teeth at this stage. Correct. And in fact, talking about inequality, if you go to the next slide, right, this is from the, um, from the US. This is the wealth inequality chart, which just shows how their policies have over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years have actually squeezed the bottom half of the, um, the, the people in the US, right? The top 1% owed a huge proportion of the, uh, the wealth pool. They've done really, really well. Um, but there's a bunch of people that actually have not done well. And so we've got this uh, neoliberal view where effectively the top of the pile are doing fantastically well and, you know, frankly, being supported by central bank policies. But the bulk of people, the bulk of the communities, are actually being ground into the ground. And that is the fundamental problem that we now have. We see the same in Australia with, you know, the bank of mum and dad, as we mentioned earlier, right? If you can get money from your parents to buy a property, you can buy a property. If you haven't got rich parents, you can't do that. The inequality curve has got more and more out of whack. And unfortunately, central bank policy has created the problem, not helped to bring about what their mandate is to do, which is a more, you know, uh, supportable and uh, sustainable economy. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We're joking about, is it going to take four people to pay off a mortgage? And here we are, we have bank of <laughs> mum and dad. So maybe it is mum and dad and all their savings and everything being thrown at the couple mm. to try and get on that property ladder. Yep. Um, there's a good, you know how the Federal Reserve, their notes are made public, um, the minutes from the meetings, mm. I think it's five years after. And Powell himself, when he was just on the board, he was talking about how all this would play out, how the markets would be addicted to this easy money. Um, this would happen to interest rates. We'd never be able to taper and take it away. And and he basically predicted all this and said how bad it was going to be. Now it's happening. And now he's kind of denying it. It's the same with Phil Lowe. We covered everything that he said about what how this was going to play out and all the dangers. Now it's happening. And they're basically just turning a blind eye. They've moved the goalposts. They're copying the U.S. and just saying, let's aim for 4% unemployment. That's mm. exactly what the U.S. did. Yeah. It's just comical. Yeah. No, I agree. And in fact, if you go to the next slide, you know, the RBA, while well, they held again, no surprise there, they said basically the you know, local economy is a bit stronger than, than forecast. And they've upped their um, GDP um, forecast a bit as well. Um, the uh, quarterly state monetary policy will be out today. So that'll be, I think, saying the same stuff. But as I mentioned, Guy de Bell gave a lecture last night and he really drove a very important point home, which basically... If you tighten monetary policy, it's going to cost jobs. 
So he's basically saying, you've got to put up with much higher home prices and it's not our responsibility to worry about home prices. Um, it's other people's policy uh, levers, right? So no responsibility for the home prices. Yet we know that home prices are so high because credit has been so free and easy and rates have been so low, right? It's a, it's a remarkable statement of failure and of narrowness from the Reserve Bank, which I just found real remarkable. You know, it's just absolutely amazing, right? I uh, it's another example of the the blame game and trying to deflect. I think even was it um, APRA, the control of um, housing stability, came mm -hmm. out and said that that they are not concerned or it's not their. You know, they don't have to worry about house prices. They're worried Correct. about the stability or just something ridiculous like that as well. Correct. Yeah, APRA and RBA, but both of them saying house prices nothing to do with us. And of course, in New Zealand, it's very interesting. The, the Reserve Bank in New Zealand had the same stance up until the fact that they were then given a mandate from government to include thinking about house prices and the impact of house prices by monetary policy. So they've now got to incorporate what's happening to house prices in their monetary policy stance and they've got to explain how what they're doing is connected to house prices. They've, that's a big shift in New Zealand. Of course, they've also introduced macro prudential, so they've basically taken away some of the tax breaks for investors. They've tilted the playing field more to first-time buyers and uh, increased the loan-to-income and loan-to-value ratio uh, formulas that people have to go with. Um, so there's a first sign in New Zealand of a central bank beginning to sort of have to take responsibility. But in Australia, house prices, nothing to do with the Reserve Bank, nothing to do with RBA. Well, I just ask you the question then, Alex, well, who is responsible for home prices in Australia? Because there's um, got to be yeah, some accountability I mean, even, somewhere. Um, Scott Morrison in his, I think it was before the election, he was yep. promised, basically promised to, to put up house prices Correct. as well. Yep. Um, Mission accomplished, eh? Yeah, what worries me is the RBA, their stability for the prosperity of Australian people. How, I just think the worst thing that's going to backfire, it's already starting, is as this gets bigger and bigger, all that money, whether it's 40% of an individual or a couple's wage going now towards property, now you're dipping into mum and dad, all that money would have gone into the economy. They would have mm. gone out to dinner. They would have gone on a holiday, gone to the movies, whatever it is. That is money that is not going into the economy. It's going to the banks who have put people into this debt position for 30, 40, maybe 100 years. You, know, it, you just think about that for a second. The banks, are again, record profits and even in um, you know, some of these tough times around the world, They've copied these massive fines for all this criminal behaviour and nothing really has changed. It mm. is insane that the position they're in, and even central banks are starting to realise that now that, hey, if we create a central bank digital currency, um, the the need for that intermediary as a commercial bank is, is kind of gone. So this is going to be very, very interesting that they've, they've kind of made another enemy. Um, and this is why I think the blame game is kind of started. Absolutely. Well, everyone is saying it's not my problem, right? And what they basically said is, we are, you know, taking rates low. We want to boost household wealth and hence spending, right? So basically, what they're saying is, take some more debt, go go spend that, right? So in other words, increase the debt monster even more. That's their only strategy. We'll keep rates low. They know they can't raise rates because if they did, then it would actually crunch people even harder. And also, it's worth noting that the debt burden is rising but if you go to the next slide you'll see that in fact if you look at credit growth all the credit growth is in housing right and on occupation annualized is up 6.1 percent now um you know investment is started to move up again but business lending so this is lending to real businesses is still negative annualized right and that's my problem so all of the stuff they should be throwing into the economy for the future and to d develop businesses and innovation, all of those things. No, that's happened, right? Businesses are borrowing less. Businesses are becoming a less critical part of the economy. And what we've got is this housing, construction, low rate complex. And we're just trying to get more spending from households by taking more debt and then using that to drive the economy. This is a really, really sick economy. Yeah, we'll have a look at this um home loan commitments and then i want to have a, a bit of a rant, a rant man but um 
This has okay. gone steep here. This is in billions. So this is a pretty significant jump, isn't it? We're talking like ten billion or more, fifteen billion dollars. Yeah, the home commitments, absolutely. So it went up thirty point two billion in the month, right? That's a that's huge, right? Huge, in, and it's interesting that there's a tilt now. So more investors are starting to come back into the market. Um, interestingly, the construction. The new construction dropped off because home builder was turned off. So that shows you how artificial that was. And um, the other angle is if you go to the next slide, first time buyers are actually a little off from where they were. So, you know, there's, there's some things changing there with um, you know, some of the dynamics. But nevertheless, if you look at the um, overall situation on, on slide 10, you can see that the investor growth was actually stronger in March than owner occupiers, right? So we've got this, we've got this credit machine right and if you go to the next slide on 11 this is where i've i've borrowed a slide from the guardian where you look at housing finance and house prices and what it says is with housing price um where it is and where finance where it is prices are going to go higher ahead right so the old rate of change of credit is the most fundamental lever to drive house prices higher and we are set for a very significant price rise hike unless something changes. And I don't think there's any chance of that changing. So how harsh prices are coming. That, that's crazy to think about that steepness of that chart and, and house prices. Um, so I explained this point to one of my friends the other day. He's a pretty switched on guy and, and he never thought about it like this and maybe people at home haven't either. But a bank uh, gets to create money out of, out of thin air basically and even to the point now where the central banks have said don't even worry about reserves too much if anything happens like a bank run will print 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 hmm. and so what is happening now is that it's very easy for them to create a mortgage because it's a nice comfy you know good yield for them uh it's it's long duration that customer's locked in for life there's a nice juicy asset there that they've basically taken zero risk they've at the end of the day they've pushed a button on a keyboard and they get to repossess you know take a house if anything goes wrong not only that but they can cry poor and they can package these things up so they're you know mortgage-backed securities collateralized loan or debt obligations um, take these bad mortgages put them in with good ones and rate them really high and central banks are buying these securities off the, the these banks so they get to sell them and trade them and make money and then if anything ever goes wrong they know that the central bank will come in and buy them off them so the, they don't lose in any single situation they're not even taking any risk but if you go in there as a small business think about it now that's a big risk they've got to have an actual analyst probably the local branch and they've got to do this work to see if you're worthy that's all time and money and effort that they don't want then if anything goes wrong you know that business fails they don't really get to repossess anything per se they're not packaging that up as a financial asset they get to speculate on wall street and create derivatives off so there's no incentive for them to do that at all mm, and right. look what's happening you put these yeah. things in place these banks have become casinos there's no lending to real businesses like martin just said is it is it a surprise when they've basically created the rules and they've got the government and regulators under their thumbs and this is so, the way it is yeah, so there's a moral hazard, right? So basically the banks are fine because they're always going to be bailed out by the government, right? And in fact, uh, international investors res regard our banks basically as government-backed, right? So that's that's one of the reasons why they're happy to uh, you know, to invest in them. The other is that um, the Baal capital ratios means that it's four times more capital advantageous to lend for a mortgage relative to lending to small business, right? So the rules are rigged. Right and now the, the argument was well it's relative risk but no no what's happened is we've got a banking system that is not fit for purpose right if you go back 20 30 40 years a greater proportion of lending was for business rather than for mortgages it's completely reversed now so we've got more of our banking system just throwing more money at people to buy more houses to inflate prices allows them to inflate their balance sheets allows them to make more profits because the volume goes up uh, and by the way of course the term funding facility from the reserve bank is still in place 0.1 percent for three years so they've got this really really low interest rate of funds that they can then lend, lend out so mm. all of what's been happening over the last year or so it goes back to my fundamental point it's all about bank keeper this is all about keeping the banking system right it's all about supporting the banks it's not about supporting the real economy and that's the problem that I've got with what's going on at the moment. We have to find a different path if we're going to actually make our economy work. But, you know, the regulators 
are actually part of the problem, not part of the solution. And yet, most people would actually say, well, the Reserve Bank surely knows what they're doing. Well, I'm not sure they do. No, as you say, the regulators in America, you know, stamping all these things, AAA, and saying there's nothing wrong to, right before it all, all collapse. Mm. So, uh, you know, uh, next up we've got uh, stress. So it's it's still up and we're yeah. starting to see the roll-off of COVID, are we, Mike? Correct. So what's fascinating about this, and because I measure this through my surveys, so, right, so very low interest rates, right, and we had uh, JobKeeper, JobSeeker, so it brought stress down. But all of this... All this house, house, high, house price hike and everything else is, is happening at a time where there are more households who are actually in difficulty, right? So you've got 41.1%, which was up from last month, right? That's more than 1.5 million households on a cash flow basis struggling with their finances, right? So we've got this absolutely weird situation where some people are doing really, really well and everything's fine and they've got savings, you know, and they can hand money to kids and everything's good. You've got this other proportion of the population that are really hunkered down with many part-time jobs with a lot of pressure on them. That's the problem that I've got. And unfortunately, there's not enough people highlighting the soft underbelly in our economy and all of those people who are really up against it. And in fact, if you go to the next slide, you can break it down by different states. You can break it down by mortgage holders, rent holders, um, the people who have investment properties, because quite a few investment properties are actually also struggling as well. And so we've got a proportion of the population who are not getting any benefit from this, this, this whole thing at the moment, right? And in fact, they're going backwards. And the worry I have is that over time, we're going to see more mortgage defaults. In fact, Westpac in their significant profit to improvement announcement also mentioned that they were seeing a rise in 90-day delinquencies for mortgages. And we're seeing that in our data too. So we've got more people struggling. And so we've got a really significant inequality mix going on here, right? And once again, the economy is not fit for purpose. We've got your uh, net rental yield continues to get crushed. So this was another reason when you can get a nice juicy yield on the property and renting or whatever, then sure, it's uh, attractive. But if we start to go down this inflationary path where the stock market is going up 7 to 10% a year, it's another reason why you know getting 2 3% renting with all the other risks that you're taking um, is less attractive. Yeah, so this is just a net rental calculation. So it's a cash flow basis. So I'm comparing the rental revenue actually generated and this is a Melbourne example. Melbourne is the worst place for property investing at the moment, right? And I then look at all the costs going out, so paying the mortgage, paying the agency fees, paying, um, you know, maintenance, all the, all the stuff you have to do, right? And basically, a good proportion of properties in and around Melbourne are underwater on a cash flow basis. And in fact, uh, many units have very low vacancy rates, particularly closer into the centre of town. And many houses out on the urban fringe in those high growth areas have significant problems with negative returns. So the gross rental yield, which is the price of the property relative to the rental, theoretical rental, is the one that's always quoted by the agencies in you know, real estate sectors. But you've got to look at net rental. And that net rental says to me that property investing makes very little sense, which is why in my surveys, I'm seeing a considerable rise in the number of property investors, even now, even with those price rises and everything else, saying time to sell. So they're selling into the uh, momentum that we're seeing. So that's going to be another very important um, uh, thing to watch, but another indicator of a, a, a non-well-balanced economy. Mm, okay. So we've got a few changes here, Martin, with your... Yeah, so, so just finally, this is just my latest. So I've incorporated the latest RBA data, which basically says, yeah, well, house prices, if, if you believe the Reserve Bank on, every, on all its parameters over the next three years, we could see prices 20 30% higher on average. Varies by location, right? My own view is that's probably an overstatement. But nevertheless, even assuming the virus gets under control and the vaccines get rolled out and we don't get hit with lots of uh, additional ones, you know, it's more like a... 25% max over the next two or three years. I give that a 50% rating in my modelling now, whereas a few months back I was much more negative. Um, there is also the longer term crunch if we get more um, outbreaks or worse if we get the, um, you know, the multi-wave like in, 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 in India. I hope we don't, but I give that a relatively small rating at the moment. But you can see that overall prices will be higher over the next two or three years on the, on the round. Now, 
houses, standalone properties particularly doing well, units not doing well, oversupply, um, all the hot construction issues. So we're seeing this bifurcation between houses and units, in which I haven't really represented specifically in this chart. But nevertheless, chances are, my probability is now, prices are going to be higher over the next few months. Well, there you go, Martin. People can't say that you're bearish on property. <laughs> you're exactly. predicting that they're going to rise. And yeah, I'm not sure what they're going to do. Now Melbourne's ticked over that million dollar mark. At what point is it just so outrageous? You've got to do something. You know, 1.1 million, 1.2, 1.3, right. and they go, holy crap, like it's 30% in a year. Whatever it is, there is that much money out there. And the banks aren't going to, you know, slow down. This talk that, you know, Friedberg was saying there, too cautious or whatever no, 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 no. Used, they're accelerating record. their lending so the volumes coming through new lending is is up massively right they do, we don't need any changes to responsible lending that's not required at all um they're, they're not going to slow down they're going to make more money the bigger yeah. the mortgages are so correct. they're going to be the last ones to tell you that correct it's it's too big the mortgages that they're lending and whatnot so but just so just remember folks that this is supporting the banks the banking system it's making them more profitable right and that's good for the banking sector but it doesn't help the real economy that's my problem we've got a myopic focus here and unfortunately um i don't think the budget next week is going to bring much to bear to try and right the ship, right? It's going to continue to shoot off down the road with higher home home prices and uh, you know more stimulus for the construction sector. Probably look at the high rise. I expecting policies particularly to help the high rise sector in the in the budget, right? I wouldn't be surprised to see that. But we have got this completely off kilter, and unfortunately, nobody wants to really own up to what's really going on. I had um, Senator Janet Rennick on. In fact, I had to bump you off my show f to have him on because he's going to do it. And s the senator was really very powerful on this. I recommend you go watch that show because he was highlighting precisely these issues. The whole economic basis on which we're setting decisions at the moment in Australia is taking us up a blind alley. But there's very little appetite within the political world to do the right thing. So. Yeah, just as I said, banks get to create money out of thin air. Governments can also spend money into existence. And I, I, that, yeah, we're so far behind in our understanding of monetary policy. Half the crypto crowd probably understand it better than our regulators and, and, and leaders and whatnot. Yeah. Um, everything we're doing, yeah, as you say, is just starting from the wrong, wrong place and taking us in the wrong direction. No one wants to bring about any changes. Um, the Australia Post thing is a great example of trying to lean towards a community bank. Um, even the guys at Citizens Electoral, um, Citizens Party, try to start this national bank to just to lend for infrastructure. Like anything like that is what we kind of need. Other countries have done similar, but there's not even any talk of, of it starting. So uh, what do you do, Martin? We'll just keep commentating each month on what's happening and hopefully our followers are switched on and they are doing what's best for themselves. Well, I think that's right. I mean, there's two, two levels, right? So individually, prepare for some of these futures where, in fact, it might be more deflationary rather than inflation, where in fact prices could still go higher and, and all that sort of. But more importantly, at the more political level, it's important we start engaging around some of these things, right? And we don't let the politicians get away with just supporting the construction sector and just uh, supporting the banking sector, right? There's a real economy out there that needs massive amounts of help, right? There's real businesses that are really struggling. I just hope that in the budget, we see some policies aimed at that. That's where they should be f uh, focusing. Um, there are alternative policies that could be executed. So I do believe there's a political and pol you know and, and policy conversation to be had too. And I'm going to be pushing some of that as I um, continue my channel. Cool. Great place to end. Thanks for joining us as always, Martin. And we will see you guys next month. Cheers. Thanks. Martin.